<clears throat> okay, uh, hello. Um, today is uh, February 19th, uh, 2023, and we'll talk about the important um, uh, Romanian sculptor Constantin Brâncuș. This is the Romanian pronunciation. He is well known outside of the country as Constantin Brâncuși. People pronounce his name uh, in various ways, but the Romanian pronunciation is Constantin <clears throat> Constantin Brâncuș, in the opinion of Wolf Prix, the most important artist of the 20th century. It's hard to say something like this. This is his opinion. There were many important artists in the 20th century, but he was one of them. Let's read a little bit about him. So, Constantin Brâncuș, born February 19th, 1876, uh, was a Romanian sculptor, painter, and photographer who made his career, career in France. Considered one of the most influential sculptors of the 20th century and a pioneer of modernism, Brâncuș is called the patriarch of modern sculpture. As a child, he displayed an aptitude for carving wooden farm tools. Formal studies took him first to Bucharest, then to Munich, then to the, the Ecole de Beaux-Arts in Paris, from 1905 to 1907. His art emphasizes clean geometrical lines that balance forms inherent in his materials with the symbolic allusions of representational art. Brâncuș sought inspiration in non-European cultures as a source of primitive exoticism, as did Paul Gauguin, Paolo, Pablo Picasso, André Durin, and others. However, other influences emerge from Romanian folk art traceable through Byzantine and Dionysian traditions. I, I will say something about this being the so-called patriarch of modern sculpture. If there is something that uh, makes me uh, a little bit, uh, uh, or to say a little bit uh, uneasy is exactly this. Because I think we had and have too much patriarchy in the world and maybe we need some matriarchy. I mean, this uh, masculinism, I think is, um, is problematic in whatever field it manifests itself. Uh, this was the man, a uh, handsome uh, young man a photograph taken in Romania before he left for France. Here he is uh, with a backpack, um, um, you know, leaving the country. He actually left on foot towards Paris. It took him a whole new year to arrive in Paris. But this was a man of destiny. He was moving towards, you know, uh, uh, playing an important role in, 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 modern, in modern sculpture. Uh, as you see, he was dressed, uh, re dressed rather, you know, uh, in, a, in a seductive way as an urban dweller. He arrived at his folkish, uh, you know, attire in Paris. In other words, Brâncuș became a peasant in Paris. He didn't live as a peasant. As you can see, he was dressed, you know, rather fashionably uh, and not not as a peasant. Here he is, uh, you know, after he's achieved a lot of success with a nice uh, tie and, uh, you know, white shirt and all the rest. Uh, here he is, a, de a determined, very determined man uh, who made it, who made it with sacrifices because from what I read in, 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 in Paris, he had to support himself, uh, you know, to survive with... Uh, all kinds of little jobs, you know, like washing uh, uh, dishes in a restaurant. And I, I learned that um, he invented the so-called, uh, you know, uh, better way to, to quicker wash the dishes. So he had time to return to his studio to, in order to, to, to do art, because that's the reason he, he left Romania, to do art, not to wash dishes. So what do you think that method was? To use a hotter water. My God, my God, the sacrifices artists make for art are sometimes incredible. Uh, he, he also practiced photography. He um, 
some of the best photographs of his works are actually his own. Uh, I think he even manufactured some kind of a black box, you know, some kind of a primitive, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, camera uh, himself. So what does this tell us? It tells us that in order to make great photographs, you don't need necessarily the greatest technology. Uh, you need, a, you know, some kind of apparatus to take the pictures, but he, and if you have something to say and a good eye and a good uh, sensitivity, uh, you can take great pictures, even with a, you know, a mere black box. Here he is. I'm absolutely sure, you know, he made all the sacrifices in order to sculpt because that was his destiny. This was his calling. And uh, we can only admire him for this. Uh, apparently, he even uh, sang in a, in a, uh, you know, uh, in in the church. And uh, I don't know if he is dressed here, you know, for a church or not. But it's an exotic uh, clothing, uh, nevertheless. Uh, he used to. I read he used to, uh, you know, have some kind of parties at home. He would entertain very, you know, the elite of uh, modern art. He was friends with uh, James Joyce. He knew Alvar Aalto. He, he was invited in the in the at home uh, in the garden at home uh, and, and of Carola Car 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 Gideon Belker and Siegfried Gideon. Uh, uh, you know, important people in the field of art. And later on, when he crossed the ocean, he was invited at. Uh, uh, you know, uh, important art collectors in New York or around New York, Long Island, and so on. Here he is working hard, hard, hard. But but later in life, he actually he had a, a rather unique uh, non-activity after sixty. I don't know, maybe for reasons of health. But he kind of stopped working at 60, and he died at 80 or 81. Here he is not, uh, he is playing golf. And I think the gentleman with the black, I could be wrong, but it might be Eric Satie, the, the famous uh, French composer. Anyway, he was already famous and, uh, you know, uh, in, the, in the company of very interesting people. Uh, this is one of her lovers, of his lovers. I forgot exactly who. Uh, he even came once to Romania with uh, with a young, much younger lady from Ireland, and he introduced her to the you know the countryman in his village as being his uh, niece. Of course, she was not uh, his niece. Uh, a drawing, some drawings. Of, of, of Rinkush. I love this drawing, it's, it's very pure and the whimsical as well. This one also, I, I love this drawing. I mean, I think in a few lines, he was able to, you know, to, to understand visually, you know, three kids. It's, it's, a, it's a very pure drawing and it's not easy to do something like this, although it might appear that it is easy. Now here maybe some influence coming from Africa. Uh, this is a famous uh, drawing. Uh, James Joyce, the great writer, asked him to make a. I think initially he asked Pablo Picasso, and something happened anyway. In the end, he uh, well afterwards he asked Brancusi, and initially Brancusi did a figurative portrait of James Do Joyce. And James Joyce didn't like it. He wanted something abstract. So he arrived at this drawing with a spiral. Um, yeah. 
study sketches for the keys. Some works, and now I will show uh, one image of, uh, of many works by him. The Table of Silence, which everybody knows, Romania and beyond Romania. Last year or two years ago, Stephen Hall uh, wrote to me that he wants to come to Romania to see the, the Endless Column, which is not far away from the Table of Silence. The Prayer, 1907. Sleeping Mules, 1909. Moving towards the beginning of the world, as he called that uh, quintessential uh, work by him. The Kiss, 1910. Prometheus, 1911. Louis Kahn said that uh, beginnings are in harmony with the human nature. Well, it seems that Brunkusha was also very interested in beginnings, like the egg. And, uh, you know, here we have Prometheus. What would have been, you know, humankind, at least in the post-Greek uh, era, uh, without Prometheus? But let's hope that uh, the effects of Prometheus stealing the fire from the gods and giving it to us will not have some um, very tragic consequences. Muse from 1912. Well, he had several muses. He loved women and women loved him and he depicted them. The Kiss, 1912. Mademoiselle Pogani, 1913. Arch, 1915. Princess X, 1916. This culture, uh, you know, stirred up some uh, comments of all kinds uh, because of its shape and, uh, you know, was uh, considered by some as being obscene. Sculpture for the Blind, Beginning of the World, 1916. A nice idea to make a sculpture for the blind. And uh, it, it's titled The Beginning of the World. Beginning of the World is also uh, a good one from 1916. Torso of a Young Man, 1917. Sleeping Muse, 1917. The First Cry, also 1917. He had his uh, theory about piedestals, you know, that the piedestal should have some sculptural character, but it shouldn't, you know, uh, overwhelm the sculpture. It should be, uh, even if bigger in dimensions like here, but somehow less close to that meta level that Wolf Prix uh, thought that architecture should uh, should arrive at. I think also in terms, you know, in terms of art, in terms of sculpture, like in this case, the sculpture is the, in, in a way, the, the flower of the of the plant we we call the whole organism, pedestal plus the sculpture. So the sculpture, even if it's smaller than the piedestal, it should, um, should, uh, should be closer to that fruition that we call art. And the piedestal has an intermediate role between the ground floor and the sculpture. By expressing ourselves maybe in metaphysical terms, the piedestal is somewhere between earth and sky. If the art, 
we have the courage to say that is uh, close to the sky, or if not within the you know metaphysical sky. Madame L. R. Portrait de Mademoiselle L. R. Nineteen uh, eighteen. View of the Artist Studio, 1918. But this is a gouache, I think, uh, an artwork. It's not a photograph, although he took photographs as well. Golden Bird, 1920. He carved 27 birds. And he was asked at one point which bird he liked the most. And he named two, which shows that he didn't yet arrive at that essence of flight because he was actually searching for the essence of flight, trying to depict birds. The Sorcerers, 1920. Head, 1920. Torso of a young girl, 1922. Bird in space, 1923. Yes, his birds became more and more, um, you know, a spiritual because he was getting closer and closer to the essence of flight. He thought that uh, flight is a bliss. Bird in space, 1923. So you see, it's a difference between the first bird I showed and this one. The cock. White negress, an interesting idea, no? I mean, it's it's paradoxical and oxymoronic, or white negress, 1926. Fish, 1926. Two lamps, he designed also lamps. Not bad, if we are to think that they are designed. I mean, you know, maybe the base is so-called designed, although it's very simple, but the lamps themselves. So I guess, you know, like Marcel Duchamp, he liked objet trouvé, found objects. The Sinal, 1929. This is also interesting and rather not known. How is it called? The Sinal, 1929. Illustration for Ilaria Voronka's plant, uh, uh, Plants and Animals from 1929. Ilaria Voronka, an important uh, Romanian poet. A very, a very moving innocent drawing. Oh, with top knot, 1929. We already saw this drawing and let's read it again. Hupo with top knot. I don't even know what this means, but I, I like the drawing very much. Fish again, 1930, this is quite large. I saw it in a museum, it's excellent. It's the idea of a fish, the essence of a fish. The kiss, the column, 1935. The endless column, 1937. Here it is in, in Târgujiu in Romania.
a magnificent work. I remember reading about this that uh, when it was a important symposium in Turgujiu, where many important art critics from all over the world were invited, and uh, a Romanian critic Dan Haulica said that this this culture, this yeah, this culture, the endless column, is a is a is a ring of conjunction between the earth and the sky. And uh, an Austrian uh, critic said that, uh, you know, this, uh, you know, all of, it cannot be interpreted in, in religious terms, you know, some kind of a redemptive effort of the artist to, you know, to rescue himself from the earth and, uh, you know, aspire towards the sky, towards the above, because the because the earth doesn't have any guilt so it's not it's not about uh, uh, redemption you know and and the romanian critic replied yes but the, the earth doesn't make sculptures and he and both had a point actually um yes the earth doesn't have any guilt but the human being has within an Adam, no, who was banished from the paradise. And maybe a lot of art is some kind of a, an attempt to return to paradise. And the guilt is there. So yes, the earth shouldn't feel guilty towards the sky, but the earth doesn't make sculptures. It's the human being, the sculptor, who makes sculptures. The Gate of Gis, Kis, part of the sculptural ensemble, in uh, Tergujiu from 1938, so before the Second World War. A great, generous gift given by, um, by Brunkush, this, this uh, you know, complex work. The Seal, 1943. Wisdom with a question mark, but we know it in Romania, Cumincenia uh, Pământului, the, how to translate it. Uh, uh, the wisdom of, of the earth, or uh, in a way, but it's not, it's not really wisdom. Anyway, it's, it's, it's a great, it's a great work by, by Brâncu. So it's from, uh, unfortunately, uh, I don't have the year when it was made. Golden bird with the question mark again. Um, that's how I found them on a website. Uh, some of them uh, towards the end of this uh, Ed memoir with a question mark, maybe because uh, the sculptor didn't give them names. So whoever created this list of um, images of his works didn't know how to name them. So he named, he named them himself or herself. Mademoiselle Pogani, again with a question mark. Princess X. Colette. Nude. Prodigal son, so was Brinkush some kind of a prodigal son? Why, why this theme? Because this relates in a way to what I tried to refer to about that, that discussion about the endless column. Maybe all human beings with a conscience or with a consciousness are prodigal sons or prodigal daughters. The newborn uh, 
a museum for the, no. I stop here and now I, I go to the second presentation, second part of today's presentation, Brancusian architecture. Because we are talking uh, the two architects about architecture and this important uh, sculptor of uh, modern times. So, Brancus and architecture. Architecture and sculpture. I start to in, in, indirectly, obliquely, by showing, because I start from his thought that architecture is an inhabited sculpture. And I don't totally agree with him because architecture he's, has its own specificities, but a sculptural side or a sculpt, sculptural attribute or sculptural qualities uh, are important in architecture. But I wouldn't say so directly and so simply that uh, a building is a, you know, an inhabited sculpture. But that's what he thought. And because of it, I thought of beginning this short presentation, and it is short, uh, with, a, with, a, with the buildings, if we had to call them buildings, by André Bloch, the founder of uh, L'Architecture d'Aujourd'hui, the important uh, uh, French uh, architecture magazine, who was a sculptor. He actually studied engineering, but became a sculptor. And he created inhabited or inhabitable sculptures. They're actually buildings that you can enter. You could even, uh, you know, if you want, sleep there or live there. And they are sculptures. But they are not buildings in the in the in the in the in the common sense of the world, of the world of the world. But again, let's let's look take a look a little bit at, at this aspect: architecture and sculpture. By by uh, looking at a few very very interesting works by André Bloch. So André Bloch who uh, was born in 1896 and died in 19, uh, 1966. This is, a, this is a sculpture that could be, could be, could be a building. Uh, we are going to see more in detail. He built um, several, not just one. Uh, maybe I should not have begun with this um, kaleidoscope of images, but here it is, one of them. Is it a building? Well, I mean, in the sense that you can enter it, it is a building. Is it sculptural? Yes, it is sculptural, very much so. Is it a sculpture? In a way, it is. It's, it's both a sculpture and a possible architecture. I find it very moving and, and uh, you know, uh, enticing. But it's not, it's not what we usually think of a building. But it is a building. You can use it. You can enter it, and you can even uh, live there. Now, we see some bags there at the bottom, maybe some students in architecture or architects, or maybe sculptors, or who knows who, visiting it. Architects are probably reluctant to call this architecture. But I do call it architecture. It's just that it's a different kind of architecture. And we cannot say that it is not very interesting. It is. And it's possible that Brunku should have called it architecture because it is an inhabitable sculpture. André Bloch, who never studied architecture, I don't even think he studied sculpture. He studied engineering. But he was a, a catalyst for architecture of the highest order. When he died, some of the most important architects of that time lamented his departure from this earth. Because you see, there are such people who are animated by the immense love for architecture and interest in architecture. And uh, they did and do a lot for architecture, like André Bloch did. Look. 
it's a space now. It has a floor. You can put the mattress, you can sleep there, you can work there, you can dance there, you can sing there. You can do many things. So it's a building, but it's an unusual building done by a sculptor. So it is an inhabited or inhabitable sculpture. Casa de Laberinto by André Bloch and Claude Parent. The centennial Claude Bar Parent will be in one week on the 27th or 26th of February. This is a house built by André Bloch and uh, uh, Claude Parent. So the relationship with Brinkush is based on the base on a statement by Brinkush that architecture is an inhabited or inhabitable sculpture. Uh, there he says on three block architect. He, he never studied architecture. La Sculture Abitacolo di André Bloch, another, you know, uh, you see here, La Sculture Abitacolo. So it's, it's, a, it's a, the frontier between sculpture and architecture, and it's both. That's why I think Brunku should have, would have thought that this is architecture because it is inhabitable. And as we can see, someone is there, maybe Andre Bloch himself. I don't know. Now, La Tour Meudon, another work by Andre Bloch, Bloch, remarkable. I wish architects would, uh, would do works as interesting as this one. Is it a building? Yes. Is it a sculpture? Yes. Is it architecture? Yes. Of a curious kind, but it's architecture in the sense that is a is a is a it is a usable building, and you can see pictures of its inside. Uh, but uh, towards the outside is uh, you know is uh, is so sculptural that we hesitate to call it uh, uh, architecture. But well, you see, you can get in. Obviously, the man loved architecture and he loved buildings. And he carved this giant sculpture into a building. And he carved the building into a giant sculpture. Andre Bloch. I love it. Of course, it's not for the bourgeois, you know, there are no, there is no glass at the windows. There are, you know, there is no kitchen, there are no, uh, you know, there isn't a, the paraphernalia of uh, comfort that the bourgeois likes. But it could, it could, it could be used as a building. And now, what's going on? I should have put here, now we go to, I, sorry, I prepared this rather in a hurry. I should have said the next building that I show is a Wolf Prix and Kop Himmelblau because for Wolf Prix, as I already mentioned, Brunkusch was the most important artist of the 20th century. And now we are going to see a part of this large building that he built that he was, it could be related to, to the work of Brunkusch. Is this part here, although it is, um, you know, broken, so to speak, it's it's um, it's eroded, uh, but but from a different point of view, uh, you know, like here, it's almost like an egg, the egg or the beginning of the world, standing uh, vertically, but then excavated within or in excavated, if there is such a word. Uh, it is rather strange that Wolf Briggs always said that he wants to, 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 to build an architecture of complexity. While Brunkusch, whom he admired so much, said the opposite. He, he was searching for simplicity. 
and he thought that simplicity is a resolved complexity. So here we have the architect of complexity admiring the sculptor of simplicity. I, I, I would have been curious to know what Brunkus would have thought of this work. Volprix even made a proposal, I don't probably uh, in a, on a volu voluntary uh, basis for a museum uh, for uh, Brun Brunkus in uh, Tergujiu. I didn't see though that, that project, but uh, I was told he, he, he made a proposal because he does love uh, Constantin Brunkus. There is no doubt. Now the fluidity is uh, the fluidity that that in this case Wolf Prix worked with is is not really explicitly connected with Brunkush, but as we saw here in this picture, it's almost an approximation of of the of the the beginning of the world that uh, that sculpture for the blind that Brunkush uh, made. Uh, now I, I, you are going to see a, a project I did many years ago uh, for a competition, uh, a museum for the birds of Constantin Brunkus. And this is the, the drawing I made. This was before the arrival of uh, the digital uh, culture in architecture. And uh, I placed uh, the the uh, superior part of the drawing, all the birds that he uh, that he uh, sculpted. Then you see a longitudinal section through the building, then a cross section, the side view, and then at the bottom is the plan uh, of the museum. But I will read a short text about what I did. Uh, I was typing it with a manual typewriter and. Uh, it, has some, it needs some editing, but I'll read it to you. All his life, Brunkush tried to find the essence of flight. He made 27 birds, more and more perfect, more and more spiritual. First, he made seven wonder birds, then four gold birds, and finally 16 birds in flight. He was never satisfied, but this was because he had a giant purpose to express into a physical form the spirit of the flight. How to do a museum for his birds? I thought that it must be somehow a mystical place for a ritual initiation into the mysteries of the spiritual flight, a trip to there where the sky and the earth meet together. I imagined four sequences. First, the entrance, like in a tomb. Second, a narrow corridor without light. Third, a big room, a big room like a maternal uterus, like a womb, top lit only with the birds in line, one after the other, in the same order the sculptor made them. Fourth, an outside view, the beach, the sky, the sea, and maybe some birds, real birds flying to the infinite. Finally, I observed, interesting coincidence, that the museum brought little by little, the shape of his birds. And you see in, in the plan that actually the, this, this happened unconsciously. I, I, uh, I didn't intend to, to arrive here, but trying to accommodate the 27 birds and uh, you know, with the skylights, identifying the three periods in his uh, uh, you know, uh, work, devotion, devotional work to this theme, birds in flight, I arrived slowly to this horizontal bird, which is the museum. But you see in the section, the longitudinal section, how things, you know, uh, were to happen. Uh, and then uh, here I made a, you know, a sketch, manual drawing, of course, on the left, uh, the bottom, um, the entrance, like in a tomb, then the dark corridor, then the, you know, the maternal room, the big uh, room with the 27 birds aligned, and then you exit the museum and on a, some kind of a balcony, you can contemplate the sea, the sky, and maybe some real birds. Now flying to the infinite or who knows where. 
Now, SPAN, uh, SPAN uh, is an architecture group, uh, well, group is a partnership between Matthias Del Campo and Sandra Menninger. They won the competition, a competition I launched uh, a number of years ago for a new museum for Constantin Brancusi in Paris to replace the building built by Renzo Piano, which I consider uh, inadequate for for uh, properly representing the spirit of uh, Constantin Brancusi, the spirit of the works of Constantin Brancusi. I even invited Renzo Piano, but of course he didn't participate. But Matthias Del Campo and Sandra Menninger won the first prize. Unfortunately, my website was ruined by uh, Yahoo from, you know, that I rent the, the website from Yahoo and they made some technical so-called improvements and now all the images cannot be seen. And I have about 2000 2, projects there. I mad at them. I couldn't extract images from that competition. I found the works of Span on the web, but low resolution, I would have liked to show other projects because more projects were sent, some of them very interesting, but impossible because uh, the website was, uh, I hope, temporarily ruined by, uh, by Yahoo. Uh, here you see the site plan of the, of the project of Span, uh, and it's, um, you know, a very, here is uh, on the north side, uh, Centre Georges Pompidou by um, Renzo Piano and uh, Sir Richard Rogers and Peter Rice. And there was another architect whose name, un unfortunately, I forgot. They won the competition and they built it, Centre Beaubourg or Centre Georges Pompidou. This is the proposal of Span. And this is where the building by Renzo Piano now is. Uh, I'm sorry for the pictures. They are not... Uh, very easily seen, but you get some kind of an idea, but I, I, I don't have the text written by Span. What is very interesting is that the project they made for this um, competition, Matthias Del Campo wrote to me that two years later, he considered this project the grandfather of the project with which they won the, the Austrian pavilion at the World Exhibition in Shanghai. I think in 2012, and uh, you know, I I, I like this uh, relationship over a span of two years. I, here is a section, in my opinion, here the ceiling was a little bit too low uh, for Brunpush for his sculptures, but the plan and the I hope I have uh, the yeah, eye. They are a little bit hard to to see, and I apologize. You know, I, I would direct you to, towards the website, ecarch.us, but I checked in the morning and there were no images. They said that they will restore them, but I don't know when. The museum essentially is this one. And what you see on the left is Centre Georges Pompidou, you know, uh, a digital uh, rendering. But this was supposed to be the, the museum as conceived by um, Matthias Del Campo and, and Sandra, Sandra Menninger. And you see it here, where the landscape becomes architecture and architecture becomes landscape. And what you see here on the right are the uh, constitutive parts that compose this uh, organic, uh, you know, uh, roofing of the building. You see the birds of Brunpush here in this uh, rendering of them. And here is another rendering that they um, sent us. Now I, I, I show the uh, uh, skyscraper built by uh, Gini Gang, Studio Gang in Chicago, which has insinuations of the motif of the, the endless column that we, we saw already. Uh, this is apparently the tallest uh, building ever built by a lady, by a woman. Bravo to Ginny Gang. And I said uh, two years ago in March, Ginny Gang was with us here on, on, on this Zoom platform and we even sang happy birthday to her. 
and you can see that um, recording on on uh, on on YouTube. And you see here, it's it's the endless column, not just uh, bidimensionally uh, present on on this portion of the facade, but you see also in the in the volume of the of the of the towers, and not so not with the same proportions, not with the same uh, you know uh, oblique lines, but it's the motif of the endless column. And it, it is indeed a, a, a huge, a very, very tall a skyscraper that uh, Gini Gang and Studio Gang uh, built in Chicago. You see here, uh, I didn't write the text. This is the tallest building in the world designed by a female architect. And you see here, you know, insinuations of the endless column in the building uh, that was built in Chicago. And now I end this uh, short presentation with the work that was built in uh, in Romania. Uh, oh no, I don't understand. Uh, I I had I I really don't understand what happened because I included I included the the work by uh, Stefan Dorin. Uh, I don't understand. It's possible I erase it. I just don't believe it. Anyway, we have to stop here. I'm very sorry about this.